Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. I'm Jim Lauterbach, I'm the GM of VidCon, and I am so happy to welcome you to this session of VidCon Now Asia, where we're gonna be talking about and exploring what the heck is going on with those things called NFTs. Now, I'm not gonna explain what an NFT is. What I'm gonna do is bring up the host of the session, Jason Fielding, who's gonna come join us and lead this amazing session to talk all about what's going on with NFTs around the world. So Jason, thank you for joining us. Um, Jim, good to be here. Yeah. There you are. What's going Hi, on? Uh, great to see you here. And uh, you know, it, it's fascinating. I'm really glad this session is actually happening because we were chatting on another session that we were on that you are hosting. Uh, and we kind of got down this cryptocurrency NFT rat hole that kind of we both thought would be a good thing to bring. We were preparing Asia. for uh, Live Matters, which was a couple of months ago about live events bouncing back uh, post COVID, and yet we we got sucked into the crypto rabbit hole on that on that sort of pre chat chat we were having, and here we are. Yeah, I'm super psyched that uh, you know you and Jasper and, and everybody at VidCon were able to make this happen. And for those of you who need a little bit of refresher on VidCon, VidCon is the world's largest set of festivals, summits, and events about online video. Community-led media, including podcasting and other things in general, our large event, our biggest event we started, I don't know, 11 years ago, is in Anaheim, California. We actually just announced Tickets on sale Tuesday. They went on sale last Tuesday in Anaheim, the 21st to 24th of October. That's in the U.S., Anaheim, California, where Disneyland is, happiest place on earth. But we've got events around the world later this year and then into next year. And everything from fans coming together to see their favorite creators to emerging creators who want to learn how to do a better job building on YouTube or TikTok or Snap uh, or any of the platforms that are out there. And then an industry track that is very much B2B where we talk about things, including crypto and NFTs and how to build a better presence for your business on all of these social platforms. So I encourage you to join us there. We'll be in Singapore later this year, most likely, and lots of other places as well. And just so, the contact with you is this, this is the first NFT chat panel you've had at VidCon? We actually did a crypto one on the U.S. side for VidCon now where we explored what was going on with NFTs, but also with some of the blockchain. We've explored also a little bit another topic that I find fascinating that is somewhat related, which I know we'll talk about more on VidCon Asia as well, just around would you invest in a creator and the way that blockchain and coins, whether it's BitCloud or Rally or others, allow you to actually invest directly in a creator and what they're doing. And if the creator does well, hopefully share in some of the growth of that creator too. So, so many things to talk about in this area. Way too much for just the time we have allotted here. Dave, let's get into it. Yeah, well, I'm going to back out. Uh, Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let you uh, bring your panelists up. Great chat. I'll be back at the end, maybe with a couple questions. I'm sure you'll cover it all, but who knows? And then we'll wrap up a little bit. So I'm going to step back and let you take it away. Thanks, Jim. Um, we're going to um, bring everyone in, in a second. I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to this session, um, one of the first VidCon uh, sessions on NFTs or non-fungible tokens, uh, to give them their proper name. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping uh, for the audience watching. You can ask some questions at the end. You can put them in the chat and uh, the team here will, will pick them up and we'll try and pick up uh, two or three questions at the end to, to, to get through. We're going to assume that people watching here have heard of NFTs, uh, have some sort of rudimentary understanding, or at least they've seen uh, some of the high profile projects that have been out uh, over the last few months, the NBA Top Shops and Beeple's very high profile um, record breaking artwork that got sold. Uh, but as the panel suggests, we are gonna ask the questions, what the hell are they? Technically, but really we're gonna focus on where, where does this all go? with a focus on sports, music, arts, and the, sort of the, the, the greater creative ecosystem. So, there's a lot to unpack in, uh, in a short amount of time. And to help us get through this, we've got a fantastic panel. I'm so grateful for everyone joining and spreading their time. So, um, if we can bring everyone in, we've got uh, Raoul Powell, Krista Kim, and Collie Miles. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. To Hi. kick off, maybe maybe we can go around and uh, you guys can just give a quick intro on, on yourselves. Uh, Crystal, ladies first. 
Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Krista Kim, and I'm a digital artist. I'm the founder of the Techism Art Movement, and I'm uh, the one who created the Mars House, the first NFT metaverse house that was sold in the world last March. And it was sold for 288 ETH, which was a record on Super Rare. And um, I'm also the global ambassador for Super World, and I'm very much interested in the metaverse and the next generation of NFTs. Thanks, Chris, and we're going we're to be talking about all of that. Uh, Raoul in, uh, in Cayman or Little Cayman? I'm in Grand Cayman today. So Grand my name's Raoul Pal. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision, a video on demand platform around finance, crypto, and kind of everything in between. Uh, I've been hugely involved in this space since about 2013, and I'm very, very interested in where this is all going. So looking forward to talking about some of that. Looking forward to digging in, and Colin in Singapore. Sorry. Thanks, uh, Jason. I'm delighted to be on this panel. I represent uh, Zilliqa. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer. It's a Singapore-founded blockchain, high-speed, high-security, high-performance blockchain. We are investing heavily in the creator economy and NFTs. We've launched a few different things in that arena, and I'm very excited to talk about them on this panel. Thanks for joining. So to kick things off, um, just let's technically, from a purely sort of technical perspective, an NFT is a unique digital asset, which is held on blockchains, Ethereum, Flow, which is the MBA, Top Shops, uh, Dapper Labs, blockchain, of course, Zilliqa, Zill, um, as a way to represent for the first time using cryptographic encryption, unique digital ownership of something. But that's the the technical side of things out of the way. Just wanted to ask you very briefly, sort of one by one, what what you think NFTs represent? And Carl, we're gonna start with you from a blockchain perspective on the technical side, because I think a lot of people might be interested in what actually an NFT is, um, technically. And we're gonna cheat a little bit. We're gonna play a little video first. This is VidCon, so I think we can do that. So if we can play uh, the, the, the little intro video that Colin's team put together just for this panel, and then Colin, Colin and I might just check in on that afterwards. Thanks for putting that together, Carl. That sort of helps bring it to life a little bit. But technically, what, what the hell is an NFT? Well, effectively, it's a smart contract, and it uh, registers uh, some, someone's ability to own something on the blockchain. It's immutable, it's incontrovertible, and it's there forever. So uh, it's really something which can have a legal standing, potentially. And it's uh, something which also supports uh, physical as well as, well as digital goods. So, uh, for example, uh, we issued tokens to tokenize whiskey. So you had ownership of a whiskey bottle, which is very clear, uh, but something you can trade. So it, it's, it's very exciting to see how far uh, NFTs can uh, prove ownership. And technically, it's the code, which we just saw in the video there. That's, that's actually what the NFT technically is. That's right. It's, uh, in, our, in our case, we use a code called Scylla, created our own code, which is uh, highly secure. It's uh, quite uh, flexible as well. You can write in a lot of inf information and metadata, and that links generally to greater content, which is held and stored either uh, with AWS or on IPFS, depending on your choice of storage. So there's quite a few components in NFTs. Uh, the single most important part is the smart contract. 
Okay, so that's the technical side done. This panel, we're going to really explore kind of the more creative e expressions of what that leads to. Raoul, Raoul what, in a sort of short and capsule, a capsule uh, view, what, what do you think NFTs represent? At the top level, anything that has value has scarcity. And an NFT is proven scarcity. So much like a signature on a piece of art by the original artist makes it more valuable than a print. Um, and that's essentially what an NFT does. But there's a whole load more to it as well. Because this smart contract that is immutable and never dies, you can attach a whole bunch of things to it. And it's actually a big breakthrough. Art was the first plus to break through, but after that comes everything from IP rights to ticketing to anything that you want to attach to it and people might have heard people talk about the tokenization of the world that's really nfts so we'll get into this in a bit but it's a very very big breakthrough in how digital value or value overall gets exchanged in this new digital web 3.0 world and and it's there it's the scarcity has always had value but until encrypted technology, digital assets, digital things didn't have that ability to be actually truly scarce. Exactly. Yeah. Krista, you um, you you mentioned the Mars house. And we're gonna yes. jump to that in a second, but what what do you, what's your kind of top line view of what an NFT represents to you as a creator? Well, you know, as a digital artist especially I've been creating digital art since 2013. And my greatest challenge was that my art can easily be copied. And, you know, it was a problem until I discovered NFTs last uh, December. And it's incredible because it's really empowering for creatives. Uh, we actually have control and we have uh, autonomy over our careers. So it used to be that we'd follow the traditional gallery model to be discovered or to, to have a collector see our work but now we have access to collectors' eyes through these incredible platforms, and we actually have a greater percentage from the sale. We're not we're no longer giving 50% to a gallery. We're earning 85% on average from the sale, and we're also receiving 10% royalties for every resale. So that's that's quite a development, and it's never been like that in the art world. So it's empowering you as a as a creator. Indeed. Yeah. You you um you and I spoke um, earlier. You, you were telling me how you, your journey last year. So, so many of us went on journeys last year uh, around the world. You were a tr traditional, more or more traditional artist, kind of pre pre COVID. But what happened to you, sort of March, April, May? You, you went on your rabbit hole trip. Right. So you know, during the height of the COVID crisis. I was sitting in my condo and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to create my dream home. I want to escape to a beautiful place. So I created the Mars house. And the Mars house really, the whole concept came from the idea that um, technology can heal us. So I wanted to use the screen, and this is basically what I do fundamentally as an artist. I use the screen as a mechanism for healing and well being. And so I imagined that we can actually have entire substrates of our architecture, ceilings, floors, and walls made of micro LED walls, and that we can actually have artwork streaming on them. So why not have healing artwork with healing sound frequencies to create a meditative atmosphere when you enter the house? So this is my uh, inspiration to create the Mars House, meditative design. And I think we, we've got a little video of, of the Mars House, very sh very short one. Should we should we play that quickly and maybe bring that bring that to life a little bit?
Very, very cool. You now, you and I actually met in there earlier this week, and we, we had a we had a, a hangout and a, and a bit of a chat. So, for the audience at home, can you that just sort of link the NFT coding side of thing and and how that works and where it sits and right. So, uh, so last December, I discovered Bitcoin and Ethereum, and uh, for my own personal investment strategy, and I I googled blockchain for art. Then I discovered NFTs, and then I discovered Super Rare, and I I applied for Super Rare immediately, and I was whitelisted for February, and so I minted which my is first which is, the, which is the marketplace. Correct, Super Rare, yeah. and so uh, I actually had a wonderful conversation with Rish Lotlikar, who reached out to me shortly after I minted my first NFT, and he told me about Super World. Uh, a metaverse platform that is augmented reality. It is the uh, internet of augmented reality of the world. So the entire world is uh, interfaced uh, and you can actually purchase 3D land on top of the real world. And so you're buying real estate and you can actually upload 3D digital assets into yeah. any space in the world. Okay, so this opened my eyes to the next generation of NFTs. And I thought, wow, I have a wonderful home that's already built on Unreal Engine. I have the 3D model. I will offer this as the first metaverse house in the world because this is where the future is of NFTs. And that's that's a nice segue maybe to, um, and, and Raul, I'm going to maybe throw to you to, the, to this term, the metaverse, which we're all discovering and, and I'm watching you actually interview a, a few people um, over the last few months has opened my eyes what maybe tell the audience what what the metaverse is and people are going to think when we talk about the metaverse which is a digital rendition of of a world that we live in people will think it's gaming gamings are just one metaverse what is actually happening is we are moving towards a more and more digital world so if we think of where we all were 10 years ago or 20 years ago, the world was much less digital. We are here all using video interfaces in real time around the world. 10 years ago, this didn't really exist. That's part of what the metaverse is. It's where we're all going. The metaverse is actually a place which there, there's several being built out, whether it's Decentraland, CryptoVoxels, or even places like Fortnite. Fortnite and the gaming world has about 2 billion plus people already living and using it all the time. You can actually earn an income within it. You can undertake activities that have economic value and get paid in tokens. You can also own things. So before we were all discovering this from the crypto world, gamers were trading skins. What's a skin? A skin is basically that human tribalism that I will overpay for a t-shirt because I want to show that I wear a particular designer, right? The cotton is $2. The t-shirt costs nothing to make and I'll pay $150 because I want to be cool. That exact mechanism that humans have always done exists in the digital world too. So there's kids who are exchanging what's known as a skin, how they look, their digital representation of themselves. They'll also buy swords or other things that unlock elements of a game. That was really the essence of where NFTs came from is realizing, okay, great. Now I've bought this thing. Does it have value if I leave that world that I was in, Fortnite? It's sort of dig and digitizing human nature, really. Yes, I mean it's it, well, it's digitizing our world in a rendition that doesn't have to be human in any way. It doesn't have to be any reflection of the world. Like Chris's house doesn't have to be a house. It doesn't have to have you... any of the functionalities of a house because it doesn't matter because it's a different world. Much like you... a house here in the Cayman Islands is built for hurricanes. But a house in Melbourne won't be. They're just different worlds. Yeah, you you've been exploring uh, crypto voxels recently. I think you told me is that something you're looking yes. at there? Yeah, I mean, I have not told anybody in the office yet. So I've been doing a stealth project that I thought, well, I'm just going to build a a real vision building within um, crypto voxels. Why crypto voxels to me? Not that I have any skin in the game. It's just that somebody sent me something. I was talking about the metaverse. He said, oh, you need to go and check out this NFT gallery, right? We're all used to somebody giving us a website. So I click on this web link. It wasn't a web link. 
It was a coordinate in a metaverse. I arrive at Crypto Voxels. I have to take an avatar, which is a digital rendition. I can take a blank avatar because I didn't have my own character. And it took me directly into this art gallery where I'm looking at the NFTs. Some are video, some are visual, some are moving, some are still. There's a soundtrack and there's a there's like stores of records as well that I can flick through and change the music I'm listening to. And I looked at that and went, oh my God, that's the end of websites. And then when you think about it, you can create any world. So I think it's the end of platforms as well because we can individually yeah. design our platform. So we can have all of our experiences, whether it's Twitter here, video there, TV there, something else going on here, your research over there, your artwork on the walls, it can be your space. So that's the end of the platform world. It was like a holy shit moment to see this and realize, okay, it's all going here. So we're actually building out quietly in the background. Again, nobody at Real Vision knows this yet, but I've commissioned an architect. We won't tell, we won't actually, tell anyone. And we're actually doing the opposite because everybody's doing what Krista's doing, which is seeing how far they can take their imagination, which is amazing. And we're just going to do the opposite because it's Real Vision and we like to do that, which is we're creating a Victorian warehouse pub style building which will be headquarters because it's going to look very different to everybody else's space age designs. But again, you can do anything you want. Um, and it's incredible. And that will be a dip, digital representation of me, Real Vision, our community, what it feels like to be a Real Vision member, much more than you can ever be on a website. And mm. that's just the start. Because once you start applying tokens into this world and creating experiences, you create money in these worlds and value exchange that changes business i can't wait to see the real vision house next to the mars house and maybe maybe jump from one to the other um we're gonna i'm gonna focus for a bit now on, on the on this panels about sport music gaming and how nfts um are sort of applied in, in those realms um we're seeing we're seeing the early expression of nfts i think with people's passion points um, and sports and music and art, these are all these are all things that people are passionate about. And with sports, we've got NBA Top Shops, uh, Major League Baseball. I saw this morning that uh, FTX have just announced a major deal with the, with the Major League Baseball League in, in the US. Uh, Formula One have got a, um, a really interesting project with Red Bull team and the Tezos blockchain. And Colin, you've got uh, you've got a very interesting football sports NFT. Uh, Projects which uh, I'd love to talk to you about. Can you give us a bit of a bit of a background on that? Because some really high-profile names in there, isn't there? Yeah. So we had a partnership with Polaris, um, obviously based out of uh, Portugal, yeah. and representing I'm sorry for those, uh, the audience watching. Polaris is big management company, Cristiano Ronaldo's management company. Yeah, that's right. He, he had a good night last night for sure. Um, and I think his fan base will be very excited about what he's doing. Uh, in terms of uh, the players we work with, yes, uh, some of them like Camis uh, Rodriguez has 16 million followers on Twitter and uh, a large following on Instagram. And they're really getting into this idea that they as individuals can control their own image rights and monetize those image rights through NFTs. But it's not a sort of standalone commemorative NFT. There's lots of behind the scenes information, insights into their lives, their passion for the game, their emotion, their journeys, and also the tools of the trade, the, the merchandise that they have, the boots that they wear. Everything is now interconnected um, with the NFT logic, which uh, someone can buy through our Zillstars uh, website. And who's, give, some, give us some examples. Who, who's, in the, who's in the lineup? Who's in your squad? Oh, we've got uh, 10 players. So uh, obviously Diego Costa is uh, one of the better known ones from the UK, uh, formerly with Chelsea. Uh, Ruben Diaz, who's uh, obviously playing in the Euro tournament. Uh, Pepe as well is playing for Portugal. Um, so you know, we've got some, some big names. And I think that uh, this will continue in the sports arena because we, we look at this holistically, not just current players, but past players, legends of the game. We have a partner called UFFS. Uh, based out of uh, Canada and Costa Rica, and they've built uh, fantasy leagues, and they have uh, what they call uh, living NFTs. So effectively, the entire career of a sports player, sports star, either going uh, consequent, 
consequently with their achievements season by season or retrospectively going back to where they started many years ago. So they have this fantastic way of creating a, a living NFT which always updates with the, the work and the, and the profile of the player, what they've achieved in, in their life. And the player themselves will get recurring revenue from the sales of those NFTs. I was going to so, ask, in a, in, a, in a really simple way, what what do the players get out of it and what do their fans get out of it? What's that, what's that value exchange there? Yeah, so the fans are obviously showing their love and recognition of the player, but they also have them in a fantasy gameplay environment. So there's uh, scoring mechanisms and point mechanisms, there's leaderboards, there's all kinds of ways to creatively engage uh, the fan. But the player themselves, as long as their name is being used, they will get a percentage of the revenue generated from that gameplay. Well, it's very exciting. How many, how many NFTs? It's live now, isn't it? How many... How many have been bought? So they've been traded. What's the, is it sort of ongoing now so indefinitely? Yeah, indefinitely. It's there forever. Uh, in terms of the uh, the platform sales, the first week or so, we did about $1.2 million in, in sales. And I think that uh, going forward, we'll add more interesting elements to that site. Obviously, trading cards is a very well understood uh, way of engaging the sports stars. So adding trading cards is going to be quite a, an important next level for us and making things dynamic and uh, everlasting for the player's career for us is, is really critical. That's very cool. Chris, the jumping to, to jumping to art, we talked about how, how NFTs are, are empowering artists. How, how do you see that really playing out in terms of changing the dynamics and the, and the environment for artists to ex express themselves? Well, I think that um, it definitely gives, you know, artists more um, artistic agency, definitely. But what I'm more interested in is basically how we can get behind uh, social impact. And I think that uh, artists should basically focus also on, you know, giving a percentage of sales um, to, to worthy causes. Like with the sale of the Mars house, uh, the majority of the sales actually went to uh, a foundation, Continuum Foundation, oh, which finances... Yes, which finances a world tour of healing sound and light installations around the world. So we're starting our tour in August, August 20th to 22nd in Toronto. And uh, we're teaming up with uh, a major production company to, to create this world tour. And it would not have been possible without the NFT. So, you know, if you really think about how artists can really come together and create incredible social capital and value through their uh, activities for the community. Uh, there's a huge opportunity there. Amazing. Um, and music, Raoul, you're, you're a big music fan, I know, and, and certainly certainly a big part of my career. This is really smashing into the traditional music space and op opening up all sorts of interesting, interesting opportunities. And you spoke to a few artists, haven't you, over the last few months? Yes. I think there's a wholesale business model change coming, not only to music, but almost to any business that has a community around it. But music is a great one because we're all passionate about the artists that we follow and like. What happens in music is about 80% of the economics gets lost between selling something and the artist yeah. receiving it. It's extraordinary where it all goes. There's middlemen at every layer and there's double middlemen or triple middlemen. So even when you go to a ticket sale to a concert, there is Ticketmaster or whoever it is selling the ticket. There's then usually a, another group that will buy a whole bulk bunch of tickets and sell them at a premium, which are the scalpers. And that's a whole big business now. It's not the guy in the, in the trench coat outside the stadium anymore. And then there's the high frequency traders in the middle. So there's, there's this huge market. And that goes at every level. They lose all of their rights over Spotify and everything else. Their music's everywhere. There's no digital scarcity. And so they don't get any money from the music. So then the only way artists monetize is by creating rare scarcity, which is a live event for a fixed group of people at a fixed time. And then they charge, you know, $100 for that, let's say. So that, however, they've lost control of their audience. They don't contact their audience to reach their audience. They have to use all the social media platforms and everybody else and they have to pay more rent to do that, to lease their audience back. 
they're all looking at this thinking something has to change. They lose their IP rights digitally everywhere. So if anybody streams any music anywhere, it's really hard to track down the IP. So they look at this thinking, well, we're, we've lost control of everything. And then suddenly NFTs and tokens come along and they realize not only can they get their fans involved to be part of a community, but to take an economic stake in that community. And then they have a direct relationship with their fans. They create value for those fans. Those fans create virality for the music and the artist because they want more people to come in that community because these tokens will go up in price if the artist essentially is more successful and creates more value for their fans, which is the definition of success. So it's not just a pure monetary exchange. It's a value exchange at many levels. And embedded within that is the ability to use NFTs for tickets. So you create scarcity on tickets so you can't trade them again. Mm -hmm. You can create NFTs around rarity. So you can take, you can find along your value curve the richest super fan that you have and create a piece of music for them, solely for them, that only they can own. You can charge them $10 million for it. You know, if David Bowie were alive today and he made a single NFT album, he could charge probably $20 million plus. Well, Bo Bowie, Bowie kind of called this 20 years ago, didn't he? Of course he did. He called everything. <laughs> but the, Bo the Bowie bonds was exactly this. It was yeah. tokenizing his back catalog. And that brings you on to the other part of this equation is IP rights will be tokenized and tradable. So let's say major art recording artist, Taylor Swift, record releases a new song. Right now what happens is she has to pay for that song to be made and produced and then launched. And it's a risk, right? So this way you could crowdsource it by saying, I've got a new song, do you like this? If you like it, you can buy a stake in this song for the next three years worth of economic success of this song. So then if I'm a super fan, I bear a little shake in, uh, stake in that, I put my $50 in, and I'm now on TikTok trying to make videos all day using that song, because if that song is a success, my $50 worth of token, I'd be worth $500. It's genius. It changes everything, including how you market everything. And that works for every community, even outside of music. And, and do we, this really is about communities then, where I think it's this all, first wave it, of NFTs so, has maybe been about value extraction and selling NFTs and selling stuff to people. But really, this is where we're going, right? It's so, community. yeah. So, if you think about the community model that came, the, the network model that came with the internet, Facebook was a great example. So Facebook, you've got the community, which is the people who used Facebook for the facility of contacting group, groups of friends or contacts or to market over it. And that can be over you know, WhatsApp, Instagram, or Facebook, regardless of the, the network of that, that Facebook owns. The only var value accrual you got was to be able to contact that person or sell to that person or buy from that person. Yeah. However, the shareholders got rich. The difference with the token-based economy is the shareholders are the users. So everybody gets rich. So if network effects work and the value of that network grows and there's interconnectedness between the nodes in that network, everybody makes a fortune. It is a gigantic change to business models, which is a push-only, use advertising, sell product business. This is not that world anymore. Communities are changing everything. And that is the way forward. Yeah, Chris, so you're, you're nodding furiously there. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. That also obviously resonates with you. Yeah, I, I would also love to add, and I agree with everything that Raul says, um, every organization, every celebrity, uh, every brand, what name you, will have a metaverse experience. Uh, yes. They will have a VR experience that transitions also seamlessly into an AR experience. So just think about when Apple glasses launch uh, these glasses will be out in full force by 2025. So the world will change. That means that our lives will be enriched and enhanced with NFTs on a daily basis. And for the audience watching who, who are maybe across the Apple glasses, what, what are they going to do? Oh, sorry, they're augmented reality glasses. So there's something like eyeglasses, very light. And uh, you wear them, you go outside and you can experience Augmented reality 3D experiences uh, in real life, in real space Not and time. The so the, uh, so yeah. just, to, just to come in on that, so Apple have built out an augmented reality entire world. Our world, completely 
built out, including the inside of buildings. So with these glasses, right, you're not looking at your iPhone anymore, figuring out where you're going. You're walking through and it's showing you exactly where you are, where to turn. I mean, the, the AR thing as part of this, as Krista said, is huge. But then you think about the uh, the creative revolution, uh, the, the renaissance that will occur. It's just the incredible assets that need to be created to support this economy. I mean, think about, for example, the Mars house. If you think about people who are able to purchase a digital skin for their house during Christmas and convert their house into a gingerbread house. And you think about parties, children's parties where teddy bears will pop out of birthday cakes. You'll have balloons floating in the sky. Everything is augmented reality. And to, to back to back that up is there are already massive music events going on where you dress up in your virtual self, you turn up and you can yeah. be sitting next to your friends in a stadium in the digital world, watching Travis Scott with 20 million other people having your there. unique experience. <laughs> you were there, right? So, mm -hmm. so what Chris is talking about is not the future, it's the present, it's happening in front of our eyes faster than anybody realizes. Hey, Chris, so you just mentioned the, the Renaissance there. I'm just going to go off piece for a second here and get a bit historical. So the Renaissance came on the back of new technology, the printing press, and actually 50, 60 years prior to that was the plague, the Black Death. Is there a real analogy here now with where we are right now, with this, this technology that's, that's rolling out a lot quicker, but we've just gone through our own, obviously, pandemic and that's changing society in ways that we don't really fully understand yet and probably won't for 20, 30 years. Is there some real parallels there? Would you think, are we entering it really, really entering a sort of new chapter in, in our history? Perhaps, perhaps there are, but I would say that this is probably the most revolutionary period of human history ever. I mean, we're, we're not repeating the past here. We're actually creating a new future. We're, we're working with a blank canvas. So what we need when we ha we're faced with a blank canvas is we need creativity, we need vision to create a new world, new systems. It's absolute disruption of every pre-existing model that existed since the Industrial Revolution. Everything is going to change, everything. And our, even, even our values have changed. If you think about the millennials and Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they are such different value structures. They want community, and they want, they, they basically believe that they can make the world a better place. And this is a real ingrained belief and they want brands, they want, they want to create community and action and actually be involved in these kinds of activities. And I think DAOs, if you look at uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, I believe that these are going to be a powerful mechanism for social change uh, on the ground level for people to just have act, you know, to, to find a solution to a problem in the world and just fix it with a group of people and just get it done, you know, bypassing all of the bureaucracy, bypassing all the politics, just getting it done. I think DAOs are going to be very powerful. It's all feels And I think very... if, you, if you have a DAO, but if you have a DAO, and think about this, and, and a DAO invests in a work of art. There was an artist named IX, uh, Shell, and she's a wonderful artist, uh, coding artist, brilliant. She, uh, she sold a piece of art on foundation uh, in collaboration with an organization that protects data sovereignty, data, uh, data privacy. She sold that piece for $2 million to a DAO that supports the cause. So they've invested in a work of art which actually supports the cause. It's a win-win situation. This is the future of social impact investing. It's, it's it's so much positive positive energy and sorry, Colin, you're going to jump in there. No, I think it's absolutely the right pathway. Uh, we're creating an emerging artist fund. It's uh, something we've been doing for a while, and it will be run by a DAO. And it's uh, the most exciting project we're working on, I think, right now for the artists that we're talking with in Southeast Asia, especially. And I think this model of business is uh, the perfect partnership. I mean, obviously, we have the capital and we have the community and now we have a model which enables democratic capitalism and where 
Where question for for everyone here? It feels we've been in the sort of first innings of of, of NFTs, but to really jump ahead where where it's just a normal part of life for everybody, what 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 has to happen for that experience or that interface or that? Because at the moment you've got to buy some crypto and you've got to have a, a wallet and there's some steps there that some people are are, are going to be a bit reluctant or, or just aren't going to be interested in, in taking. How does this roll out where it just like an app on your phone it becomes an app on your phone <laughs> it's, yeah it's as simple as that and yeah. don't forget that app on your phone which will be encrypted will hold not only your digital art your digitized nft of your personal data that you can share either in a blind way in a in a um, zero knowledge proof way or any other way it will hold your investments it will hold um, your community tokens, it'll hold your voting rights within a DAO, it'll hold everything. And that's not very far away. I mean, MetaMask is a start moving towards it, but there is zero chance that Apple don't integrate this and zero chance that Google don't. So that's all coming. And then it's all going to be facilitated by something called interoperability. So right now, it's difficult to move one thing from one platform to another or one blockchain to another. This is Web3 okay. and... Yeah, well, just basically the fact, if, if you buy a skin in Fortnite, you want to be, be able to use it in another game. Warcraft, yeah. Minecraft, right? That's simple as that. Because then it has real value because you can, you can move it around different worlds. Much like if all of your clothes were worthless as soon as you crossed a border, you couldn't cross borders, right? But that's what happens in the metaverse right now. That's all going to change. So... It, we're not very far away because both the interoperability layer is being built and the wallet layer and then the central bank digital currencies and these stable coins like Facebook DM, everything's within three to five years of entirely being here. So looping it back to say sport, you're a fan of the NFL or the AFL in Australia. You, uh, you're part of their community and through the tokens and the, and the relationship you've got there, you might get something, buy something, win something, you might then be able to take that to a game that's got a lot of kudos because there's only 10 of them in the world, or is this where this all links up? Yes, it does. And also don't forget, if you happen to have um, um, NFTs in the community of a particular artist and the artist becomes successful, you're going to be checking your phone every day because the value of your wallet's going up. It's like a yield on your interest. Right, right now, we spend our attention on these platforms and they extract the value. Our attentions, we will extract or share in the value with the artist or the creator, which is how it should be, because that is the direct transfer mechanism. If Krista makes art, a community member, a fan, a, a um, collector, that is the, relation, the value relationship. Why should somebody stand in the middle? It's, it's not fair on the creator, or of the yeah. or of the community member, and this changes everything. And and Chris, you mentioned brands um, as well, they're, and they you know they usually jump in slightly late to the party, but uh, inevitably jump into new yeah. technology and new trends. How, how, how brands going to get weaved in? We're not going to start well, seeing we, buildings we, everywhere. Or? Well, I, I think that brands really have to be open to the idea of decentralization as a cultural phenomenon, and you know, we're, we're discussing this already about tokenization and, uh, you know, co-vesting and investing in, in a brand, being part of the brand, create co-creating the brand. Brands have to be open to actually sharing ownership of what they are and being open to, um, you know, the, the collaborative co-creation and the input of the community. So once again, it's all about opening up to the community having metaverse in, you know, um, experiences for the community to interact and, and have value through the community and extract value through the community. So it's and maybe it's quite changing fascinating. brands have always tried to control their brand. They're going to have to embrace losing control to some degree, right? Precisely. I think that it's all about surrendering that control and allowing for the co-creation to begin. Because think about it, you have an entire generation of gamers that are that are going to be adults very soon. What they're into is co-creation. 
You look at kids on Roblox, they are co-creating on a platform that's part of a community. That's what they're used to and that's what they want. So, yes. Um, I'm conscious of time and want to get to some questions. So to sort of, to sort of just wrap up the, this, this, the chat, what, in, in, in this sort of concise way, what, where, I know we've touched on it, but where, where are we going? Where will this all ultimately lead? Let's jump 20, 30 years ahead, which to the, in today's world is crazy, right? The pace of technology change. But where, where are we going to end up here? Well, for me, I believe that we're going to be living in an XR lifestyle. I believe that our lives will be enhanced with technology. I, I, at least with Superworld, we believe that, you know, we want to make the world a better place through the technology. So we want enhanced medical, we want enhanced education. And I think that the world will become transcendent. I think the metaverse culture will become a transcendent culture that transcends uh, the old divisions of the past. It's a whole new world where people are basically entering and interacting on a metaverse above the world in a quantum, in a quantum state, right? So it's a quantum XR lifestyle. Quite fascinating. Carl? Yeah, I'm fully vested in a tokenized planet and that gives us the opportunity to have veracity at the ground level, to trust really everything that we own, want to own, want to interact with, create, innovate. Uh, I was involved with projects in 2010 with augmented reality. And it's very exciting to see how far it's come uh, all these years later. And uh, we said also in uh, well, 2001, I think when we spoke, uh, Jason, that we thought the mobile phone would be the remote control for your life. Now we have the mechanisms and the technology to enable the phone to allow people to fully immerse themselves in so many different arenas and, and benefit from it. You and I were talking the other week about tokenizing our time, which is the ultimate scarce asset that all of us have, right? Completely. And uh, we're seeing huge projects uh, in the UK. We have a partner called X Academy. They're working with all the YouTube influencers and they're moving into social tokens at great speed. So there is that direct connection between the influencer and their audience and how they interact with the algorithms of YouTube. So it's this merging of technology and, and humanity, which is very exciting for all of us who are in a creative space. Raoul, where, where are we going? Where are we ending up? All of us are going to seamlessly live between the physical world and the digital world. And the metaverse is where you will go to school. It's where you will have a drink with your mate in the pub because you don't physically have to go there. You don't physically have to go anywhere. Now, that sounds a bit of a sad world. We still have nature. We have the world around us. It's not going away, but maybe it takes some of the stress off the nature that we live in, right? The, the you need to use cars, the need to pollute becomes much less when you live a lot of your life in a digital world, as we're already all doing over the pandemic. It was like a lightning bolt moment for all of us. It's like, God, I don't need to get on a plane and a car all the time. But everything, so as we said, education, don't forget, they're already using augmented reality and it will be metaverse for, for surgery because with robotics, you can live in the 3D universe. You can have the world, you can be the world's best surgeon. You can undertake surgery anywhere in the world by using robots. And this is not far away. This is not like some crazy weird future. This stuff is happening. So, you know, this world, if we're talking about Apple and everybody else moving towards this as our Facebook, who own most of the world's kind of VR IP rights right now, this is all everything. So it feels like, but your kids live in games and this is ridiculous, which is what everybody's going to be thinking cynically. Or it's this sounds like Ready Player player one. one. Yeah, or it sounds like Ready Player One. It is. It doesn't have to be dystopian. I think Krista makes the point. It doesn't have to be dystopian at all. It can be utopian. It's what we ever make of it. Now, humans are humans. We tend to screw everything up. But we've got a chance. We've got a whole new world out there. And this is, I think accretive to GDP, because imagine the fact that now a kid can be educated in Ethiopia, in a village, to the same standard as an American going to Harvard and work in the same job market digitally in the metaverse and compete for jobs. That is mind blowing how different that is. Because you're not now, and with a digital avatar, no one knows what race you are, what sex gender you are, nothing, and it doesn't matter. And that 
is again game changing it feels like this has all come at just the right time yes. these the, things the tend world. to do that yeah these things tend to do that for some reason right absolutely yeah yeah. Hey, a couple of questions, um, and then I think Jim's going to come back to, to close. And there's a really interesting one here uh, from uh, Rushit. Can you own moments from a game? And that makes me think about can we can we digitize memories? Can we start to put our memories as NFTs? Does that become a really interesting development? Yes, that can actually happen. That is happening. That is happening. You can actually create uh, um, uh, historic moments. In fact, there is a project that the Smithsonian uh, that was produced by a friend of mine, Peter Martin at Ballast Studios. He created the MLK uh, 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 speech and he created, recreated it as a VR installation, the entire memory, true to life, everything. So you can actually be there and watch uh, his, his uh, iconic speech. And so you can actually, using technology, um, create memories and NFT the memories. You can create holograms of people who passed away and, uh, and, and preserve them forever. And your pets, I mean, this is all possible. You can create companions as NFTs in the future. Uh, 3D NFT companions that live in the metaverse that you have as friends. And you go and visit in, your, in, in Raoul's pub or you know, <laughs> in different places in the metaverse. It's all possible. This changes how history was, is recorded, which Indeed. is well because very you profound. can't have his, you can't have history based on the eyes of the victor. Because yeah. when you have the blockchain, you have history based on truth. Yeah. And truth is a messy thing, right? Truth is not this neat narrative. Truth is nothing like that. Truth is messy and com confusing and complicated, but it'll all be there on a blockchain and record it because in the end all news all news video all of the things and all of these elements of which the news is as we know several different angles it all goes on the blockchain and therefore every aspect of this is recorded as some form of truth because all of the narratives are partially true too but it's all recorded forever it doesn't go it doesn't go by storytelling where we tell this story you know being british about british empire and how amazing it was you know, I'm half Indian and I hear the opposite side about being oppressed by the Brits. As, you know, these two stories, they, they coexist. They're both true. But the blockchain records it in a way that is game changing. And as Krista was saying, you'll be able to live it too. You can live these different truths. That would be extraordinary, right? It's a new way that's of storytelling really that's cool. going to be in the future. The new way of st storytelling is the experiential NFT. And I, I love the way uh, Raoul described how you can actually uh, encapsulate ideas in an NFT into infinity for an alien race to learn about what the human race was about forever. That definitely feels like the right place to wrap this up. We've never <laughs> <laughs> the mic drop moment. I wanted to thank you before Jim jumps back in. I want to thank you guys all for your time, uh, different times of the day for you. So, so thank you. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I personally could definitely sit here for another couple of hours. Um, so, guys, thank you for an illuminating discussion. Um, I'll hand to, to Jim, who's going to pop back in. Yeah, thanks. That was definitely fascinating, I, I have to say. A, uh... A quantum XR lifestyle in the metaverse sounds great. I can't wait to live it until I lose my phone. And then I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, and I do think that, uh, you know, Christy was great to hear her talk about companions in the metaverse because it kind of brings the whole NFT all the way back around to where it started because CryptoKitties really started the whole NFT side of it. And I want those CryptoKitties to be my companions in the metaverse. So Super interesting, uh, great discussion. I think there's still a lot more questions and answers, of course, like, you know, how do you create and mint these things? Um, what's going to protect you if you buy one? Um, the market seems to be off of its highs. We are definitely in a state now where a lot of people are saying, oh, crypto is crashing. It's just a bubble. It's just tulips. It's not really what we're seeing is the market coming back down to 
I think, a level of reality, which I think is going to be much better and much more sane for everybody involved, but still lots of questions. Lots of questions about, you know, where do you get this stuff? Who's pulling the catalog together? What are the shopping carts involved? How do you guarantee that when you buy an NFT, you own it and the author, the artist can't just make another copy and sell it again? We'll be exploring all these questions and many, many more here at VidCon Now Asia, at VidCons around the world. And there'll be a lot of really interesting things to talk about as we move into this world where, as Christy says, Apple will be coming out with their glasses 2025, 27, 23, whenever it happens. And the world is going to inexorably change when that happens. And as we build these direct connections, and we can own and share in the value that our favorite creators, our favorite musicians, our favorite authors and others create. So it's a fascinating world. We'll be talking a lot more about it here at VidCon. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Colin. Next week on VidCon Now Asia, we have an extremely important session. The subject is Stop Asian Hate. So we'll be featuring Bing Chen, soon me and Josh Kua. So join us here next Thursday, the 30th of June at 9 a.m. And that's Wednesday, the 29th of June at 6 p.m. in LA and California, where I am. Join us and discover more about the critical role that media, creators, and brands can play in driving social change. I'm Jim Lauterbach from VidCon. Thanks for joining us, VidCon Now Asia. We'll see you here again next week. Bye-bye.